I really like this type of content because it's not just me covering an interesting topic, it's me solving my problem and helping you to solve yours. So I have a MacBook Pro 16 inch and I wish to extend its storage. And since you are watching this video, I assume that you are aiming for the same. The reason I ended up in this situation is that whenever I buy a new laptop, I extend the RAM first and then, if I'm still within the budget, but usually I'm not, I upgrade the storage. It's because the RAM, or they call it unified memory these days, is something that you cannot extend later by any means, but it's very, very important for the computer's performance. The storage on the other side can be expanded later by adding something externally. And turns out there are lots of possibilities. So I ended up buying a few SSDs, microSDs and enclosures. Yes, I said buying, none of these were sponsored or sent out to me. And I did some tests, compared all these in terms of price, speed and physical size. And now I'm ready to tell you everything you need to know about extending the storage of your MacBook. It's Alex here, welcome to the Geeks Table and let's start solving our problem. So option number one, most obvious and boring one, get more storage when buying the laptop. It will be blazing fast, won't occupy extra space, but it's very expensive. And if you need to share it with another device, sorry, you won't be able to. So let's move on to the second, more creative and more flexible option. It's an SSD and a Thunderbolt enclosure to hold this SSD. And because it's a Thunderbolt box, you can expect maximum speeds that your laptop is capable of. But that leads us to the question, which SSD and which Thunderbolt enclosure would be a perfect combination? So here I have five 2TB SSDs. Those are from Lexar, Samsung, Crucial, and two from Western Digital. As for the boxes, I have two from Orico, one from Yota Master, two from Acasis, and one from Sebrant. And first of all, let's quickly check what you'd get with this or that enclosure. Let's start with Orico M224C3U4. That's a catchy name. In the box, you'll get one thermopad, one heatsink, three screws with an X-shaped screwdriver, and a 25 cm USB 4 cable, which has a built-in USB-A adapter. SSDs can get very hot, so having an additional heatsink is a nice touch. Also, I appreciate the ability to use the standard X-shaped screwdriver to install the SSD. Moving on to the second one, Orico M2V01C4. How do they come up with such names? This one used to be a favorite of many reviewers, by the way, so you might be familiar with it already. In the box, you're getting a thermopad, two screws with a star-shaped screwdriver, 25cm USB 4 cable, and a separate 15cm USB A to USB C cable. I do enjoy the unique form of this metal enclosure, rather than it being just a metal brick, but I honestly dislike the star-shaped screws. In case they get accidentally lost, or if I need to exchange the SSD, I'll have to look for a star-shaped screw and a matching screwdriver. And both are quite rare to find in an average household. Yotamaster HP8C3 enclosure has a similar contents to the first Orico. It has a thermopad, a heatsink, two screws with an X-shaped screwdriver and a 25cm USB 4 cable with a built-in USB-A adapter. And while I appreciate having the USB-A option when using it with my Microsoft Surface, for example, I feel it occupies too much space when I connect it to my MacBook. So maybe I'll just end up ripping it off the cable, I don't know. Now let's look at the Ekasis TBU401E enclosure. Here we're getting two thermopads, two SSD holders, and a 45 cm Thunderbolt 4 cable. Yes, no screws and no screwdriver. The reason is that this enclosure can be opened without any tools, and the SSD is fixed entirely by this rubber plug. While this makes the installation a lot easier, I wish the SSD was secured by a screw. Moving on to the newer Acasis enclosure TBU405. This is a recent one, so let's see how it differs from the previous generation. It also has two term pads, so you can use one or both depending on the thickness of the SSD. It has three screws with an X-shaped screwdriver and a 25cm Thunderbolt 3 cable. The newer version has an older and shorter cable. 
But now we have the screws, so the SSD will be more secured, and I appreciate that. Last but not least, we have Sebrand ECT3NS. And this enclosure has an almost empty box, because it includes only two thermopads and a 15cm Thunderbolt 3 cable. And as you might have guessed already, the installation requires zero screws. You just turn this hook here, close the box, and turn another hook. But the main disadvantage is the cable. It's very short, and it's the only cable that fits inside this pit. All my other cables are too wide, so I'm stuck with this 15cm cable, and sometimes it's not enough. Also, let's check other specs briefly. This is the price that I paid on Amazon in Germany, so this is just for a general picture, but you better check in your country. The weight I listed here includes an SSD, so treat it as the final weight that you'll be carrying. The Automaster appears to be the lightest one, but it's because it doesn't use the real metal casing. And one more thing which I would like to point out, it is that for us, Mac users, there won't be any difference between Thunderbolt 3, Thunderbolt 4 and USB 4 cable. Because all of them provide the same maximum transfer speed when connected to the Thunderbolt port of our Mac. So we're good here. Now let's check the speeds. And here I should remind you that I have two SSDs by Western Digital instead of just one. It's because I decided to include at least one SSD of a newer standard, PCIe 4.0. All others are PCIe 3.0. So technically it should support higher transfer speeds. And it sure does, but only if you connect it to the motherboard of a PC. But in our case, we're limited by the Thunderbolt speeds. So PCIe 4.0 SSDs will perform almost as fast as the PCIe 3.0 SSDs. And because of that, I do recommend going for PCIe 3.0 SSDs when buying one for an external storage. This might save you a couple of bucks. If money is not a problem for you, then go with any of these. So the first Tariqo enclosure, or M224C3U4 for short, gave me the following results. And the most consistent and fast was Western Digital SN850. Then I would say Lexar on par with the Western Digital 570, then Samsung, and the slowest one was P3. I also connected them to the USB 3.1 port, and they gave me slower but consistent speeds. The other Oracle enclosure, M2V01C4, also performed consistently over USB 3.1. And over the Thunderbolt, SN850 was the leader again, and Lexar with 570 were also close to each other. However, Samsung dropped speed significantly after just 15 minutes of testing, and that was an unpleasant surprise, so I would avoid this combination. Aside from that, both Oracle enclosures performed quite similar. The Automaster was just a tiny bit worse in a few scenarios compared to the previous boxes. And while most of the SSDs performed well, Samsung dropped the speeds again. While this case has the same controller as Oracle cases, the enclosure itself is not metal, and it gets really hot under heavy usage. And by hot I mean I couldn't hold it in my hand after 30 minutes of testing. And high temperature will definitely affect the speeds of an SSD in the long run. Aces TBU401E did a good job and, well, no surprise, many reviewers praise it for its performance. Samsung didn't drop the speed in this case, and in fact it showed one of the best performances here. Something happened with the read speeds on Crucial over USB 3.1, and in general P3 was usually the last in transfer speeds compared to the others. The newer version of a cases, the TBU405, had similar results, and I'd say they were almost identical. Even the read drops of Crucial P3 and the stable performance of the Samsung were the same. But compared to the previous cases, this one got much hotter during the test, so not that I couldn't touch it, but it felt rather uncomfortable. And finally, Sabrent. I don't know what's wrong with it, but the speeds in this enclosure were almost half slower than in other boxes. Even though it's a Thunderbolt case, it won't give you the maximum speed, so beware. Also, this is the only case which has no backwards compatibility, and if you try connecting it to the USB 3.1 or any other 
non-Thunderbolt USB, it simply won't work. And before we move on, I'd like to spend a few minutes on this device here. It's an additional screen made by the company called Copcane. They are relatively new to the market, so treat this one as their first gen product. The most interesting here is the case. It perfectly matches the size of the laptop and makes it properly fixed. You can optionally add four magnets to make this construction even more stable. And the screen will attach to them with a nice click. The display itself has quite basic characteristics, especially compared to the latest MacBooks, but for this price it's a good deal. I mean, if I need an extra color accurate super contrast screen, I might use an iPad Pro, but that one is 4 or 5 times more expensive. So this one could serve me well if I wish to dedicate the main screen to the content and move all the controls to the side. Or if I'm repeating something after the tutor of the online course, and I need to have my code and the video open at the same time. I also went creative and used it in a vertical state to check some code or to read the Twitter feed. And because it's a USB-C screen and all you need is just one cable connection, you can use it with a tablet like the latest iPad Pro with a stage manager. It's a rare case when the keyboard is more expensive than the screen, by the way. Of course, it has some color and brightness controls that every screen has, and I even discovered it has a speaker built in. But honestly, I would stick with the MacBook speakers anyways. Of course, you can keep it always being attached to your laptop. It has two protective layers, a mat and a metal cover. But do note that it adds weight when you're on the go. Honestly, I feel okay with a single 16-inch screen of my MacBook. Also, 4 kilos is just too heavy but I would consider an extra one for the 13 or 14 inch screen model. Especially because both of these screens are full HD, so the smaller one has a higher pixel density. Check the link in the description and no, it's not affiliated and I haven't been paid for this promotion. Now let's get back to the SSDs. So after testing all the combinations of SSDs and the enclosures, I should say a few more words about PCIe 4.0. These SSDs may give you read speeds that are similar to PCIe 3.0 SSDs, but the write speeds may be a bit higher. We saw it ourselves during the tests of the SN850. If you can find a good deal on 4.0, go for it. Otherwise, I'd save some money and go with 3.0. Among those tested today, my personal favorite was one from Lexar. It never dropped speeds and had those a bit higher compared to the Crucial, 570 and Samsung. But I'm not convincing. If you lean towards a different SSD, there are so many out there, let me know down in the comments which you are getting. Maybe I should consider and buy that one as well. As for the cases, my top three would be, oh god wish me luck, a Cases TBU401E, Orico M224C3U4 and a Cases TBU405. Yes, I did it. I cannot pick a favorite because each of them has pros and cons that I already covered, so I'll leave the final decision to you. I just say that the SSDs from today's test would perform great with all three boxes. Maybe except the Crucial P3, that one performs best just with the Orico. But okay, what if Thunderbolt is too much for us? Too expensive or too complicated to assemble that? There is a third option. We can buy a pre-assembled SSD in a built-in enclosure. I have a bunch of Samsung ones and SanDisk also produces a few and some other manufacturers do as well. So there are enough options on the market. But don't let the advertisers fool you. While these SSDs are capable of higher speeds, they won't be able to achieve these on MacBooks with Apple Silicon. Have a look at the tests where I compare the Apple Silicon Macs to the Intel ones. You can see how much slower these SSDs are when working with the latest MacBooks. Those speeds are good enough to work with, but we kind of paid for more capabilities that we are not getting. And even the latest SanDisk Pro, which promises 2000 megabytes per second speeds, gives us half of it when working with the MacBook. So I can recommend the standard Samsung T7 2TB or the SanDisk non-Pro version, and this will be a very balanced solution. It has a moderate price, it's compact, and the speeds are good enough to use in the daily work. 
But if we want a more compact and a more budget-friendly solution, then there is an option 4. And this will be a surprising one. It's a flash drive. I have quite many of these. Some of them are more than 10 years old. Most of them have USB-A connection. This one even has a micro USB. That's really old. And this one is branded with Windows Phone. Hit a like if you remember that OS from Microsoft. So in my memory, a flash drive is something bulky, slow, and doesn't have much storage on board. But actually, and I was surprised to discover that, those products evolved. Just as an example, I used this Samsung flash drive. It has 256GB of storage, it's very compact, and it has a USB-C that supports USB 3.1. It will obviously stick out of your MacBook, of course, but if you're on the go, you can always grab it with you. It's super tiny and weighs nothing. And for a budget-friendly price, it offers decent speeds. So as a storage for something that you access once in a while, this would be a good option. Like some photos that you no longer need on your laptop or some school projects. Just don't lose it. Speaking of losing items, there is an option 5 that will keep your storage secure. The new MacBook Pros have an SD card reader again, so we can put a micro SD card into the card reader and keep it there forever. For this, we will need an accessory adapter which converts a micro SD card into an SD card. And it has a perfect shape that fits exactly in the card reader. You end up having an external memory card inside your machine, so Physically speaking, you can treat it as an internal storage. The drawback, particularly for me here, is that I shoot photos and videos, and I use the card reader quite often. And this adapter is not an easy one to take out, so I always have to use some pin to open it. Otherwise, it's a very neat solution. The question is, which microSD to use then? If you want the maximum transfer speeds, you need the UHS-2 V90 microSD cards. There aren't many, and they're not cheap at all. I used this one from Adata, and it's 256GB of storage, and it costs almost the same as a 2TB SSD. There is also a slightly cheaper version, which is UHS-2 V60 or V30, but in this case speeds will be slower. But okay, if we don't care about the speeds and we need just storage, then we might consider UHS-1 cards, which will give us even slower speeds, but we can find affordable options of half a terabyte or even one terabyte of storage. Otherwise, there is a huge variety of microSD cards of any sort, so you are free to go and check those out in the nearest electronics shop. All right, that was a lot of information, and I hope this video was helpful to you. And if you got here, hit a like and consider subscribing if you haven't already. Thank you very much for your time. It's been Alex, and see you at the Geeks Table. Bye-bye.